Thank you, Professor Rabinovich, for this excellent and uh, really a lot of food for thought. And uh, I think that what this presentation actually managed to do is to sum up what we do have in this part of the region. History defines that part of the region of this trial, Lebanon, Syria, and Iraq as the Fertile Crescent. Well, what is being questioned there is the, what we call the state center paradigm, something that uh, uh, through which we used to analyze Middle Eastern realities in the 20th century. States are being taken captive by pre-state identities. So more often than not, in that part of the region, what we are dealing with is what we call failed states. And since this is the case, as mentioned before, what we have to do is just to change and uh, be well prepared for that kind of a situation that requires a new set of insights and tools with which to deal with this region. I think that this is just one main result of the Arab Spring, kind of a backdoor of the Arab Spring. There are Facebook uh, uh, guys and Twitter and uh, whims for democracy, but as we, as, we say, as we saw here, there are kind of a bunch of what we call failed states. But when we are moving to the other side of the region, it would be of no less importance to deal with our other neighbor, Egypt. Egypt has been a barometer of Middle Eastern rhythm developments. Unlike Syria, its strongman, President Mubarak, was deposed rather easily, relatively speaking. The Muslim Brotherhood came to the fore. They were democratically elected, and their representative, President Mohammed Morsi, now stands at the head of a state which is situated in kind of an economic and social turmoil. As with all revolutionary movements, the task of ruling presents a challenge many times or uh, uh, many times greater than that of the ascension uh, uh, to power. And I think that in order to understand what's going on in Egypt, there is a fierce competition between state and religion. Who is the sovereign, so to speak, is kind of a question which is coming to the fore. To help us better understand the situation in Egypt, we will hear today from one of the, I would say, pillars of Middle Eastern studies in Israel, Professor Shimon Shamir who is a professor emeritus in the Department of Middle Eastern African History at Tel Aviv University. Professor Shamir was Israel's third ambassador to Egypt and served in Cairo from 1988 to 1990. He was also Israel's first ambassador to Jordan from 1994 to 1996. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Shimon Shamir. Good morning. As the events of the Arab Spring uh, started unfolding, and Arab regimes, one after the other, either collapsed or were powerfully challenged, observers everywhere asked themselves, what is the significance of all this? Uh, what kind of conceptual framework can provide an interpretation of uh, these developments. And uh, the tendency was, uh, seen from the outside, to put this in a global context. Uh, there is a process of democratization in the world. Uh, the countries of Eastern Europe have democratized after the collapse of the Soviet Union. In Latin America, one state after the other, getting rid of their dictators and there is more democracy there. So now it is the turn of the Middle East and what is happening there in all these countries is democratization. 
The problem is uh, that it turned out that um, what is happening, the conflicts that are taking place are not necessarily conflicts between supporters of democracy and tyrants. It turned out that there are uh, conflicts uh, which are much more significant. It was mentioned between Sunnis and Shays, Sunnis and Alawites. Um, everywhere centrifugal forces surfaced with the removal of central powerful authority, tribal, ethnic, regional, and the cohesion of the state has uh, weakened. Um, this is what is happening. Uh, I think Uzi uh, hinted at that. Could it have been seen from the outset? Could it have been predicted? Yes, because we had the president of Iraq. In Iraq, Saddam Hussein was removed, and the outcome was what Professor Rabinovich described, a failed state. Um, violence between Sunnis and Shins, hundreds of victims every month. The um, Kurdish region is, for all practical purposes, autonomous. And Iran, as a cohesive state, hardly exists. But this was not seen. And uh, the demonstrators everywhere were hailed by people mostly in the West as uh, Democrats uh, who should even be encouraged. As this refers also, of course, to Egypt, and I want to focus on that country uh, in the rest of my presentation. Uh, what happened in Egypt, everyone knows. Uh, in January 2011, thousands of demonstrators gathered in Tahrir Square. Most of them were young, educated, middle class. They were fed up with the regime of Mubarak, and they wanted change. Bitter clashes developed. Hundreds of demonstrators were killed, but they triumphed. And Mubarak was removed. The only problem is uh, that this revolution was hijacked first by the military, and after that by the Islamists, who are now in power in Egypt. What happened to those young idealists um, who were seen as the people of Egypt at the time? They were not the people of Egypt. When elections came, they could not win more than 4% of the votes. Uh, they turned out to be powerless, were marginalized, it turned out that their effective instrument, the uh, social network, the virtual social networks were very effective indeed, but they were virtual. Uh, and uh, there was no real organization behind them. There was no program, there was no leadership. So the Islamists are now in power. What is the situation? There is President Mohammed Morsi, a member of the Muslim Brotherhood, um, and he, at least theoretically, enjoys the traditional powers of the presidency in Egypt, those of Sadat, of Mubarak, even of Nasser. There is no parliament. A parliament was elected. Um, the Islamists uh, won great victory, 70% of the vote. Um, but uh, the courts decided that uh, the procedures were flawed. The parliament was dissolved. There are many discussions nowadays how to elect another parliament, but with all, because of all the difficulties that I will describe in a moment, it doesn't move forward. There is an upper house, the Shura, which was also elected at the time of uh, the um, influence of the Islamists. It tries to provide some uh, legislating, but it's not very effective in that. There is no process of uh, of providing new laws, of making uh, parliamentary decisions. And then there is the, the government, headed by Kandil, very similar to the governments that had existed at the time of Mubarak, uh, and not more effective, even less effective. And this really brings us to the crux of the matter, the effectiveness of the system. Uh, some would say it is even dysfunctional. The Muslim Brotherhood, uh, dreamt for 80 years to reach this point. For 80 years they were in the opposition, sometimes in the background. And now they are in power and they discover that managing the affairs of the state is something quite different from leading a revolutionary underground 
movement attached to ideals which can hardly be implemented. So the situation in Egypt is bad, to put it bluntly. Uh, there are problems of security. Um, you know, the demonstrators in Tahrir took pride of the fact that they shattered the barrier of fear. They indeed did that, but so did the criminals, who now control many streets and neighborhoods in Cairo and other places. Um, riot in a f after a football match, soccer match, say, uh, in Port Said resulted in 74 people being killed, and Port Said had actually to be, had to be occupied by the army in order to try and establish some a sort of uh, order there. Sinai, hardly under the control of uh, the government, of the army. Um, members of the security forces are kidnapped. Sometimes they are returned after negotiating with the Bedouin sheikhs. Sometimes they are not. Some of them have disappeared. Uh, members are killed. The police uh, station in, in El Arish, the biggest town in Sinai, is under siege, actually, and, and, and police officers try not to get too far away from the station uh, in the city. Um, so this is security. Then there are the clashes between Copts and Muslims. They had existed before, but not to the same level. Now the fanatics, the Muslim, fan Muslim fanatics, are encouraged by the fact that they have an Islamic government. So they are encouraged to uh, attack Copts, to burn churches. And uh, the Copts are in a mood of despair. Uh, tens of thousands of them uh, emigrate from uh, Egypt because they feel they have no future there uh, under an is Islamist uh, government. But the main problem is the economy. The country nowadays simply doesn't have sufficient financial resources that are needed in order to maintain stability in the country and the minimum level of, of, of welfare. Um, remember, Egypt imports 40% of its food from the outside. Um, Egypt, uh, that used, which used to uh, export oil, Israel was one of the customers of the Egyptian oil, now needs to spend $10 billion a year in order to uh, buy the um, minimum level of fuel needed in this country. Um, as a result of all this, there are long queues, uh, long lines in the gas stations, and food commodities, basic food commodities, are getting more and more expensive. And people in uh, Egypt are beginning to say it was better under the Mubarak system. At least our uh, employment, our jobs were more secure, um, at least we could buy food at reasonable prices. Um, what is the root of this problem? Um, of course, there were some setbacks. There's no tourism, no investments, those things that provided uh, a, a good part of the financing of the state uh, in the times of Mubarak and previously. But there is a deeper problem, um, industry. Uh, the Egyptians did not manage to provide, to, to develop the skills that are needed in order to produce, to manufacture, and compete in the international markets. For this, they need more openness to the world, translate more books, to have a, an academic and a technological community which is in touch with what's happening in the scientific world uh, in general, and all these things are needed and do not, are, do not exist. Uh, comparison to South Korea, 50 years ago, the uh, GDP of these two countries was similar. Nowadays, Egypt has a GDP of about 230 billions, be considering um, all the adjustments, South Korea has a trillion and a half, six times more than what the Egyptians have, precisely because of that, because South Koreans understood that in order 
to establish a place for themselves in the world economy, in this world of globalization, they must learn, they must be open, they must be in touch with what is happening in the world. So the popularity of uh, the present government is uh, declining. Um, when Morsi was elected, um, public opinion poll said that he enjoyed the support of about 70% of the population. Now it is apparently something between 30 and 35%. The criteria simply changed. The popularity of the Muslim Brotherhood was based on the fact that they were the most consistent and devoted uh, opposition force against Mubarak. And at the time when the um, regime of Mubarak was the issue, the Muslim Brotherhood was popular, in addition, of course, to the Islamic considerations. Now there is a different criterion. The question is, does he provide or he doesn't? And apparently, his uh, weakness is, uh, lies here. On top of this, um, the Morsi administration faces three um, powerful uh, challenges. One is the opposition. Uh, it's opposition in every country. Uh, this could be only expected. But it uh, should be remembered that Morsi was elected with a very small margin. And the opposition parties uh, demonstrated their influence in those elections. And they are not ready to give up. They try to use every weakness that Morsi shows in order to try to overthrow him. Uh, they have two issues. One, they say he is implementing an Islamization of the state and society. The second is that he is dictatorial, he is authoritarian. This is not the democracy we wanted. The charges, to be frank, are inflated, are exaggerated. Uh, Morsi is very cautious. There is hardly any Islamization of the country. Yes, there is some in the areas which are very important to the Muslim Brotherhood, youth, education, culture. But if you take the appointments of Morsi, he didn't put the uh, Muslim Brotherhood in the, uh, all the important positions. Uh, in the government now appointed by Morsi, there are only about eight uh, members out of more than 30 who are members of the Islamic Brotherhood. The same goes for governors, for uh, other um, offices. And the constitution that he managed to pass it has some loopholes, uh, but it is not the kind of dictatorial uh, system which the opposition uh, describes. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the situation objectively is. The fact is that the opposition has two very powerful slogans, and whenever they have an opportunity, they are in the streets. And this uh, constrains seriously the regime of Morsi. The second is the judiciary. The judges are against this uh, leadership. Why is that? Well, first, because most of the uh, judges nowadays are those uh, who uh, served during the Mubarak system. Furthermore, many of them were educated on uh, uh, the, the, the premises and the principles of French law, and uh, they uh, constitute a liberal force uh, in Egyptian society. They were the only force that dared to challenge Nasser at the time. And they don't like Morsi, and they create difficulties for him as much as possible. And he's trying to limit their forces. He's trying now to pass a law which would lower the age of retirement. This will bring about the firing of about 3,000, uh, getting rid of 3,000 judges. But this is not very uh, successful. And the third force is uh, the army. Now, the, perhaps the most impressive step that Mursi took was uh, firing the upper echelon of the military and replacing the, main, the chief generals by people that he chose and he appointed. But this did not guarantee uh, the kind of control that he had in mind. The generals, uh, yes, they were appointed by Morsi, but they are generals and they have vested interests um, in, in the economic investments of the military. 
uh, in the influence of the people, in, in the desire to have freedom from the political uh, system. So they are not supporting the regime. They are saying, we are here to defend Egypt, not to defend the regime. And whenever there are riots and Musi is expecting the, uh, the army to step in, they say this is not our function. We can try and establish some order, but in this clash between the opposition and the um, Islamic uh, regime, we are neutrals. So these are all the things that Morsi has to bring into consideration. And as a result of that, and this is going to be my last point, uh, many of the apprehensions of the Israelis at the beginning of uh, his term turned out to be not as bad as they were seen. Uh, the uh, immediate concern were that the Islamic Brotherhood, the Muslim Brotherhood, we know it's, 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 it's ideology, we know it's objective. We cancel the peace treaty. In their uh, uh, belief system, there is no place for a Jewish state in this region. This did not happen. Uh, Morsi made it very clear that Egypt remains faithful to all its international obligations. Then there was a fear that the security annex of the peace treaty will have to be changed under pressure from the new regime. And this is, from the Israeli point of view, the core of the Egyptian-Israeli uh, peace treaty. This didn't happen either. On the contrary, because of the situation in Sinai, uh, quite effective cooperation between the Israeli and the Egyptian security systems have developed. Um, it was feared that since the Hamas in Gaza are actually an extension of the Muslim Brotherhood, there will be a cooperation here, and we shall see the Egyptians supporting the Hamas. They don't do it. They found very quickly that Hamas is more a threat than an ally, that they are behind much of the violence in Sinai, even in Egypt itself. So uh, we see clashes. Uh, Egyptian, um, the Egyptian military is destroying some of the uh, tunnels that are an important source of income for the Hamas. They control the uh, crossing between, in Raf Rafah between Egypt and, uh, uh, and Gaza and do not allow uh, complete freedom of movement between the two sides. So the situation is better than what was expected, but it would not be correct to say that it is good. It is not a good situation. A situ uh, 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 an administration and a uh, leadership in Egypt which is devoted at least theoretically to the principles of uh, uh, Islamic uh, Jihad um, is an impending threat to the Israel. And there are changes. Changes have taken place. We don't have any contact with Morsi. Uh, while in, at the time of uh, Mubarak, Israeli prime ministers, minister of foreign affairs, other ministers were constantly uh, on, uh, in, in, in contact with Mubarak. Things could be uh, negotiated with him. Um, there is no contact with uh, Morsi. Uh, furthermore, the embassy is not what it used to be. I, uh, the embassy premises in Cairo had to be evacuated after the riot. Uh, the embassy is looking for uh, another place, so far not very successfully. A skeleton um, staff operates from the residence of the ambassador, and this is quite different from what existed in the, in the past. Air flights. Um, used to be five, the heyday of relations, there used to be five flights of El Al uh, from Tel Aviv to, um, to uh, Cairo, now hardly one in a month. So uh, there is a setback, but as long as the strategic joint interests are still there, and at least on the strategic level, there is a cooperation I think we haven't reached that dangerous point we feared we would reach uh, a year ago. Thank you.